In this lesson, we'll be talking about vector graphics and what the difference is between vector and bitmaps and how do you justify the use of one over the other. We're also going to be looking at how sound is represented and encoded. And finally, we're going to be looking at impact of sampling rate and resolution on sound itself. So let's begin. The first thing you need to do is jot down the key terms. So perhaps pause the video and make sure that these are recorded somewhere in your exercise book. You need to be able to explain what a drawing object is, what properties are and what a drawing list is. We're going to be using some of these terms in the lesson. So make sure that you're pretty much familiar with them. So pause the video, go with that, especially things like drawing list, which are very important for vector graphics. Okay, great. So hopefully you now know what a drawing object is, what the properties mean, which are the different attributes of an object like a circle or a square, and what a drawing list is, basically a list of all the objects that are included in a vector image. The next set of key terms are all related to sound. You need to be able to explain what sampling means, the process of converting a sound wave to a digital signal, what the sampling rate means, the number of sound samples taken per second, the sampling interval, the gap between each sample, the sampling resolution, the number of bits used to represent the sound, uh, and analog and digital data. So make sure that you pause the video and you jot these ones down as well. Let's start with vector images. Now we know that bitmap images are made out of pixels, so every dot has a color associated with it and through a combination of all these pixels, realistic image is kind of made of. Vector images are slightly different. Here we use 2D points or two dimensional points to describe lines and curves and their properties. These are then grouped together to form geometric shapes. Now think about this. If I had to recreate this shape, this one that you see on screen, what information would I need? So pause the video and just have a think about how this shape on the screen could be made. Hopefully you came to some of these above attributes. We would need the coordinates for the center of the circle, obviously because it's on a grid. We would need to know the radius of the circle itself. We would need to know the fill color, which is red. We would need to know the outline color, which is blue. And we would probably need to know the outline width as well. Now all of these attributes can be stored in a drawing list which might look something like this circle center of the circle is on the coordinates 9 comma 13 radius is 6 stroke is blue weight is 1 point of course we can add the color red as well the fill color red in there as well if you wanted to now vector images are known as scalable vector graphics. That's the format that they, they, they utilize. And this is basically an XML based image file format, which was developed by the World Wide Web Consortium. All modern browsers have some support of rendering vector images in SVG formats. And if you look at the code behind an XML image, you'll probably see something similar to what we were describing previously. Have a look at the code which is displayed on screen. You could probably create a text file with the HTML tags and then have this XML code inside it. And this circle can be reproduced in a particular browser. That might be an activity that you might want to do in the lesson to just see how vector images can be displayed. Let's have a deeper look now on the drawing list part. It includes the commands used for each object in the image the attributes that define the properties for example the colors the thickness of lines radius of any circles all of that the relative position of each object the dimensions of each object aren't defined because they are calculated in real time but the relative positions of the objects compared to each other and the order needs to be defined so for example if you've got a circle uh, and then you've got a square after that so the order could be circle square you don't want the square to come up before the circle because that will change the image itself okay so here you see a comparison between a bitmap and a vector graphic look at the circular part so when, when you look at a bitmap image it'll probably have more natural colors whereas the vector probably is going to be just a bit more artificial 
and you can see that in the eyes, you can see that in the ear, you know, it, it, it's not quite there yet. Another aspect of vector images is that most of the time when you display vector images on things like presentations, they're converted into bitmap images. Now, the term raster was used. Raster is another name for bitmap. If you encounter it online or somewhere else in text, basically it just means bitmaps. So they're exactly the same. Another example is on screen, a picture of a dog and one is a bitmap photograph and the other one is a vector graphic of, of the same Kogi. Now, if you look at a zoomed in version of both images, you'll probably see pixelation appearing on the bitmap, but the vector is gonna be very detailed. However, the problem with vector graphics is no matter how effective the artist who designs the vector image is, it's still not going to be as realistic as a photograph. If you have to do a comparison between vector and bitmap graphics, you need to make sure that you highlight that vectors are made up of geometric shapes, whereas bitmaps are made up of tiny pixels. Another aspect you can talk about is that to change a vector image, you need to change each geometric shape, whereas for bitmap graphics, it's possible to edit every pixel to change the design of that as well. And vectors obviously lead to a smaller file size, whereas bitmap, due to their use of pixels, lead to a larger file size. And often uh, vectors aren't very realistic, whereas bitmaps are. The processing time required to create the image is great for vectors, because um, in bitmaps that's almost non-existent because the image is already created. You might still need processing time for bitmaps for editing purposes, once you start editing those, displaying large resolution files can be quite processor heavy. And finally, uh, you can talk about the file formats, SVG, CGM, ODG for vectors, and obviously the JPEG, BMP, and PNG for bitmap files. So when to use what? You could answer this with a series of questions. For example, does the image need to be resized? If so, then vector is probably the, the right type of graphics to use. Does the image need to be scaled? Again, if the answer is yes, vector graphics are the answer. Are there any file restrictions? For example, file sizes need to be kept small. Again, vectors or perhaps a low resolution bitmap can come in handy here. Does the image need to look real? In that particular case, obviously it has to be bitmap. And normally, just remember for logos, plans, engineering drawings, vectors are better. And when you're using things like photographs, bitmaps are best. Next up we're going to be looking at sound files and we've just been talking about images so far. Another type of media that we use is sound files. Sound, if you know physics, requires a medium to travel through and in real life the medium is air. So what happens is when we speak, oscillations of particles within that particular medium travel and uh, waveform is propagated and the human ear picks these up and interprets them as sound. Now sound is an analog value and it needs to be digitized in order for it to be stored on a computer. And as you remember from IDCSE, we normally use an analog to digital converter to convert any analog value to, to a digital format. Now before the sound is actually stored on a computer, there are certain high and low frequencies that the human ear can't hear and these are actually filtered out. This helps in reducing file sizes and we're probably going to be talking about this a bit more when we deal with compression later on. So how does it all work? Now we can't actually represent a wave in a computer so we end up using a technique called sampling. So sound waves are sampled at a given time rate. And since the amplitude of the sound can't be measured precisely, because obviously it's digital, we end up using approximate values. Now increasing these number of values to represent the amplitude also increases the accuracy of the sound. For example, if you use 0 to 10, that would be probably a poor quality compared to 0 to 127. So the more amount of bits we use, the better the quality is. And this is known as the sampling resolution or the bit depth. 8-bit sound normally stores up to 256 values, so 0 to 255, and 16-bit stores more than 65,000 values. 
human sound range is between 20 hertz and 20 kilohertz so 16 bit is more than enough to store all the frequencies that are used in normal sound in a moment i'm just going to play some sound which is both 16 bits and then the same sound is going to be played in 8 bits so you can hear the difference hopefully this will make it very obvious how the quality changes depending on the sampling resolution Hopefully that made it very obvious what the difference is between 16-bit and 8-bit sampling resolutions. You probably are wondering what that hissy noise was through the 8-bit version of the same frequency. Think about it that 8-bits only allow 256 values. So all the other frequencies that are in the normal human hearing range are compressed and that generates this white noise it comes across as this hiss that runs throughout the sample. So the sampling rate is very important and how do we explain it? We will basically say it's the number of sound samples taken per second. The higher it is, the better the quality and the greater the file size. You get a very high dynamic range and you get less distortion, but obviously it requires a greater processing power and it takes longer to download and transmit as well. 16-bit is the normal sampling resolution that we use. So remember there are two things. There's the sampling rate, the number of samples, and then there is obviously the amount of bits we use for those particular samples. And those amount of bits are called the sampling resolution. How do we go about using it? Well, we first decide the sampling rate, how many samples we need to take. And then this gives us an approximation of the sound itself. The sound wave is then encoded as a series of binary digits based on the sampling resolution. Finally, you need to discuss the role of software in producing sound. And if you ever use Audacity or GarageBand on a Mac, you would know that software is pretty important when we are working with sound. So it allows us to change the start or stop times. It allows us to edit it. We can cut the duration of the sample. We can increase the duration as well. We can extract, save or delete samples. We can alter frequency or amplitude you know, to change the pitch. Or, or reduce it we can do things like fade in and fade out we can mix and merge different sources tracks audio samples and we can alter properties of these tracks as well we can also remove noise through different kind of effects and filters and we can convert between different sound formats mp3 wave and the rest software is very very important you need to ensure that you know a few of the ways that we can use it to manipulate sound. Okay, this is the end of this particular section and hopefully by going through this particular video you should be able to explain the term sampling rate. You should also be able to explain the benefits of vector graphics and you should be able to recommend graphics for things like okay what kind of graphics would be used for an exploded diagram of a car engine or you might want to talk about architecture drawings or you might want to talk about photographs or logos and so on you should also be able to think about how the different terms sampling resolution and how software is used to manipulate sound all of those areas should be covered you might want to experiment with html and xml and try to see if you can create vector graphics. You might want to start looking at how we manipulate a piece of sound and that's something you can probably, if you've got Audacity, you can use that. Get a sound sample, play around with the resolution. Maybe if you want to record a piece of sound, you know, change the number of samples, try to save them and then see what happens to the file size. Next lesson, we're going to be focusing on video and compression. So till then, bye for now.